Tell me, Tommy, why are you so sure there's a Santa Claus? Because my daddy told me so. Didn't you, Daddy? Hearsay. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer, and it's time to save Santa Claus. Today we are covering the Christmas classic, Miracle on 34th Street. Now, I may be a jaded, cynical lawyer, but I love a good holiday movie, especially one that involves lawyers saving the day. Because who else is going to save Santa Claus if not for the lawyers? If you disagree with me, be sure to comment in the form of an objection, which I'll either sustain or overrule, and I will pin the best comment that most thinks like a lawyer. Of course, stay until the end when I give Miracle on 34th Street a grade for legal realism, and we settle once and for all the question of whether there really is a Santa Claus or not. So, without further ado, let's dig in to the original Miracle on 34th Street. Terrible Santa Claus. Oh, could be public intoxication. Big trouble. She's a little confused, and I thought maybe you could help to straighten her out. I'd be glad to. Would you please tell her that you're not really Santa Claus? That there actually is no such person? Oh, how Sorry dare she? I agree with you, Mrs. Walker, but not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. No, 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 you misunderstand. I want you to tell her the truth. Uh, what's your name? Chris Kringle. I'll bet you're in the first grade. Second. I mean, your real name. That is my real name. So there is a philosophical discussion here that this movie sort of skirts, which is, what does it actually mean to be someone? What if your particular subjective belief about your own identity doesn't comport with what everybody else thinks? Is there such a thing as a platonic ideal of someone's identity? These are some heady philosophical questions that I'm not even going to try to answer, but I think we should probably keep that in mind as we delve into a trial over one's own personal identity. Now, I want you to stand with your feet together and your arms extended. Then I want you to muscular coordination test. Surely, be glad to. <laughs> You know, sometimes the cause of nervous habits like yours is not obvious. No. Often they're the result of an insecurity. Are you happy at home, Mr. Sawyer? That will be all, Mr. Kringle. The examination's over. You may go. I have to believe that having an on-staff psychologist or therapist is, is pretty unusual in a department store. Even in the 1940s, it seems kind of weird to have someone permanently on staff who does nothing but psychologically evaluate your employees. You're probably doing something wrong, creating a dangerous workplace if you have to have a psychologist on hand in your department store. It seems a little weird. I beg your pardon. Your job here, I understand, is to give intelligence tests. Passing yourself off as a psychologist, you ought to be horsewhipped taking a normal, impressionable boy like Alfred and filling him up with complexes and phobias? I think I'm better equipped to judge that than you are. Just because the boy wants to be good and kind to children, you tell him he has a guilt complex. Having the same delusion you couldn't possibly understand. The boy is definitely maladjusted and I'm helping Maladjusted? Him. You talk about maladjusted. Seems to me that the patient is running the clinic. Here. I won't step. Leave this office immediately. Now, either you stop... Oh, he might be trespassing at this point. Take to Macy and tell him what a malicious, contemptible fraud you are. Get out before I have you thrown out. There's only one way to handle a man like you. You won't listen to reason. You're heartless. You have no humanity. Are you going to leave? Yes. Ah! Oh, boy. I thought if you were naughty, you got a lump of coal in your stocking, not bashed in the head with a cudgel. I think Santa might be in some trouble here because he has committed a clear-cut case of battery. Battery is a simple tort that only has two elements. Number one, you have to have intentional contact with a plaintiff's body. And number two, that intentional contact must produce some sort of injury. But in New York, where this movie takes place, there are several different kinds of battery, including aggravated battery. So to figure out which particular variety of battery Chris Kringle has committed here, we need to think like a lawyer. 
New York has several different varieties of assault and battery. Uh, the first of which is the least severe, which is assault in the third degree, or commonly called simple assault, which is causing someone harm with the intent to do so. It doesn't matter how severe the injury is, so long as you have caused pain, you have made physical contact with another person without consent. That is a misdemeanor charge, which is punishable by up to a year in jail. Now, the next type of assault is assault in the second degree, which generally you do by again making physical contact with someone, but with the intent to do serious bodily harm and actually committing serious bodily harm, causing serious bodily harm in the victim. Not surprisingly, if you commit second degree assault, because it is so much more severe, it carries with it a much more severe penalty. Uh, assault in the second degree is a class D felony and carries with it a mandatory jail sentence. And then finally, there is assault in the first degree, which is the most severe form of assault, which is committed with the intent to disfigure or amputate the victim here. So it's a very, very serious penalty that carries with it a mandatory multi-year sentence. So it is a big deal. But let's put that aside for the moment and just focus on the simple assault and potential second degree assault charges against Santa Claus Chris Kringle. Chris Kringle got into a heated argument with the fake psychiatrist. After basically yelling at each other, he picked up an umbrella, a hard object, and hit the psychiatrist over the head with it. Under those circumstances, you might be able to conclude that he intended to inflict serious bodily harm on the fake psychiatrist. On the other hand, you might argue that since this is ostensibly Santa Claus here, he did not intend to seriously injure the man, but just to uh, ring his bell and to cause him temporary suffering for what he has caused the other little boy here. And you can see that the psychiatrist is not permanently harmed and in fact malingers and fakes the seriousness of his injury to get sympathy from his coworkers, which might militate in favor of it being a non-serious bodily injury uh, and really just being unwanted physical contact rather than the more severe penalties associated with assault in the second degree. However, there is a complication here because in New York, if you use a weapon, it is an automatic aggravation from simple assault to assault in the second degree. I think there is a reasonable argument that an umbrella, especially the hard end of an umbrella, constitutes a weapon and might take the simple assault from being unwanted physical conduct into the realm of second degree assault, which is a class D felony. So within the world of this movie, Chris Kringle has committed assault and may be guilty of felony aggravated assault in bopping the psychiatrist on the head with an umbrella. Oh. Merry Christmas. Henry, listen, I'm no legal brain trust. I don't know a habeas from a corpus, but I do know politics. That's my racket. I got you elected, didn't I? And I'm gonna try to get you reelected. I know, Chuck. Judges are elected in a lot of jurisdictions. Henry, it's a big problem, actually. And I'm telling you to get off this case. But why? Because you're a regular Pontius Pilate the minute you start, that's why. Oh, I don't believe it. I'm an honest man, and nobody's going to hold it against me for doing my duty as I see it. This sort of does highlight the problems that judges have in staying objective. There are a lot of political consequences associated with different outcomes, and it's really difficult to stay objective in these circumstances. Hey. Taking a cigar into court. Boy, those were the bad old days. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons having business with the special term, part three of the Supreme Court, held in and for the county of New York. Draw near and give your attendance and ye shall be heard. So what's happening here is a motion by the state to involuntarily commit someone, an elderly gentleman named Chris Kringle, to a mental institution. I actually had to look this up because mental illness law is not something that I practice uh, with any frequency. And I thought it actually might be a trope in movies that looks good but isn't true, like quicksand, for example. However, what I found is that there is actually a procedure in New York law to be able to involuntarily commit someone for a mental illness, both in the present day and in 1947 when this movie came out. And in fact, what it requires is that the state prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the individual in question suffers from a mental illness that requires immediate inpatient care without which it's likely to result in serious harm uh, to that person or others around them. So if those requirements are met, it is possible for the state of New York to involuntarily commit someone to a mental institution for treatment. Now you know. 
Get out of the well, man. The bailiff will tackle you. Before you, Your Honor, please, I should like to call the first witness. Mr. Kringle, will you take the stand? His first witness is the defendant. Mr. Kringle, you don't have to answer any questions against your wishes or even testify at all. We have no objection, Your Honor. Oh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that I can. So that was a huge strategic mistake. Chris Kringle here has a Fifth Amendment right not to testify. And it's common for a lot of people to think, well, if you don't have anything to hide, then you might as well take the stand. But that is the wrong way to look at it because everyone has testimony that may come back to haunt them. And bad things can happen based on your own testimony. So it is especially important where the state bears the burden of proof not to give them ammunition. And here, we know that there are skeletons in the closet because Kris Kringle has bashed someone over the head with the blunt end of an umbrella. He has committed assault. And it's possible he committed felony assault against the fake psychiatrist. And in a hearing over whether you present an immediate danger to yourself or others, that kind of testimony is going to be very, very important. And in fact, that testimony alone might be enough to meet the state's burden here to show that he needs to be committed involuntarily to a mental institution. Where do you live? That's what this hearing will decide. <laughs> a very sound answer, Mr. Kringle. The judge should not be opining at this point. You believe that you're Santa Claus? Of course. <laughs> but what does it mean to be Santa Claus? <laughs> In a Cartesian way, the fact that he actually thinks he is Santa Claus is a form of being Santa Claus. And in fact, one who plays Santa Claus is a type of Santa Claus, perhaps a transitory or temporary Santa Claus. I don't know that the state has made its burden here. I think it has a long way to go in arguing both the philosophical and legal questions here. State rest, Your Honor. Ooh. So at this point, what that means is that the state is not going to put on any more witnesses and it's not going to put forward any more evidence. The only testimony that has come out is the testimony that's come by way of Chris Kringle himself, which is crazy considering that he could have put the fake psychiatrist on the stand to explain that he actually was physically assaulted by Chris Kringle. That would have gone a long way towards meeting his burden. All he has done is asked a few questions, which are ambiguous at best, uh, to establish the mental state of this individual person and hasn't had any testimony that goes to whether he is a physical danger to himself or others. So at this point, I don't think there's any argument that the state has not made its burden. I think that may be intentional. The prosecutor probably doesn't want to ruin Christmas. The judge doesn't want to ruin Christmas and uh, face the ire of his grandchildren. So I think that he is intentionally tanking this case to not go forward. I believe he was employed to play Santa Claus. Perhaps he didn't understand the question correctly. Oh, I understood the question perfectly, Your Honor. <laughs> that doesn't actually solve anything, though. He can understand it, and the question can still mean different things. No further questions at this time. Yeah, there should definitely not be any cross-examination. Thank you. <laughs> in view of this statement, do you still wish to put in a defense, young man? I do, Your Honor. Oh, so what the judge is hinting at there is that the defense should not go forward because the state has not made its burden. Instead, what the defense really should have done here is filed for a directed verdict or a motion for judgment as a matter of law at JMAL. What those motions do is they signal to the court that the person or entity that has the burden, in this case, the state of New York, uh, has not met their burden. Taking the evidence uh, in the light most favorable to the moving party, it doesn't rise to the level of the thing that they have to prove. The state has the burden of proof. They have to prove that Chris Kringle has a mental illness that is a danger to himself and others. They have not met their burden. It was a big mistake by the self-proclaimed greatest lawyer in the world to not stop this trial right here because there's no reason this trial should continue. Anyone who thinks he's Santa Claus is not sane. Not necessarily. You believe yourself to be Judge Harper, yet no one questions your sanity because you are Judge Harper. I know all about myself, young man. Mr. <laughs> Kringle is the subject of this hearing. Yes, Your Honor. All right, get metaphysical. And if he is the person he believes himself to be, just as you are, then he's just as sane. Granted, but he isn't. 
Oh, but he is, Your Honor. Is what? I intend to prove that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, very amusing, but a terrible defense strategy. He has now taken on an affirmative burden, which the law doesn't put on him, and he has decided not to end this trial when it should have been ended, and decided to prove something that he doesn't actually have to prove. Not a good strategy when you're sitting in a winning position as a defense when the prosecution hasn't made their case. Go in and get Mother's scissors, will you? They're in the bedroom. That's a good boy. I don't want you to discuss this case in front of him. It would break his heart. And while we're on the subject, I agree with the reporters. Mr. Kringle seems to be a nice old man, and I don't see why you have to keep persecuting him. Firstly, I am not persecuting him. I am prosecuting him. And secondly, I like the old man, too. Wish I'd never gotten into this. But it's too late now, and there's nothing I can do about it. It's up to the state of New York, and I'm just their duly appointed legal representative. Kringle has been declared a menace to society by competent doctors. And it's my duty to protect the state of New York and see that he's put away. No matter what they may say about me, I've got to do it. I think the prosecutor does have an ethical obligation to go forward with his case as a zealous advocate for the state of New York. But on the other hand, he also has the ability to dismiss this case entirely and to drop the case. I don't think the DA has to proceed. So that's an interesting ethical quandary. I'm not sure which way that comes out in favor of the prosecutor here. I, I think he probably could drop it if he wanted to. Psychologist. Where'd you graduate from? A correspondence school? You're fired. Ooh, and now he has a claim for retaliation. Mr. Mara seems to have appointed himself the judge here, Your Honor. He's now ruling on what testimony I may introduce. Your Honor, we request an immediate ruling from this court. Is there or is there not a Santa Claus? So I actually think that this court may be constitutionally prohibited from weighing in on that question because remember, Santa Claus is a religious figure, Saint Nicholas. And under the First Amendment, courts cannot weigh in on religious decisions. Under the United States Supreme Court jurisprudence, specifically the U.S. versus Ballard case that came out in 1944, just three years before this movie did, courts are prohibited under the First Amendment from deciding religious questions. In other words, they cannot decide the truth or falsity of any particular religious tenet. And what about the Salvation Army? Why, they got a Santa Claus on every corner, and they take in a fortune. But you go ahead, Henry. You do it your way. You go on back in there and tell them that you rule there's no Santa Claus. Go on. But if you do, remember this. You can count on getting just two votes, your own, and that district attorney's out there. The judge really shouldn't be in this situation at all because uh, most judges describe to the judicial canon that the court should only decide the minimum number of questions that are absolutely necessary for the resolution of the case at hand. And here, the judge doesn't actually have to weigh in on this question. The, the court really should just say that the prosecution has not met its burden, not weigh in on the larger question of whether there is a Santa Claus or not. Can he produce any evidence to support his views? If you're on it, please, I can. Will Thomas Mara please take the stand? Who, me? Thomas Mara, Jr. Oh, they gave him a subpoena. <laughs> well, if you're going to call the prosecutor's son, you have to subpoena them. Do you believe in Santa Claus, Tommy? Sure I do. He gave me a brand new flexible flyer sled last year, and this year... And, uh... What does he look like? There he is, sitting there. <laughs> Your Honor, I protest. It is a positive ID. Overruled. Overruled. Tell me, Tommy, why are you so sure there's a Santa Claus? Because my daddy told me so. Didn't you, Daddy? Hearsay. <laughs> you believe your daddy, don't you, Tommy? Should be objecting here. Also, he should be fighting like hell to prevent his son from testifying here that's totally improper but adorable he's a very honest man of course he is my daddy wouldn't tell me anything that wasn't so would you dad <laughs> thank you tommy no cross-examination goodbye daddy <laughs>
Your Honor, the state of New York concedes the existence of Santa Claus. <laughs> oh, that may be an ethical issue for him right there. But he shouldn't have conceded. He should have just dropped the case. There wouldn't have been any precedential value in this particular trial if the DA just gave up prosecuting it and withdrew the motion to commit the defendant here. This is a problem of their own creation. I therefore request that Mr. Gailey now submit authoritative proof that Mr. Kringle is the one and only Santa Claus. That's not a legal standard. There's no such thing as authoritative proof. There is proof, and you have to meet your burden, of, generally speaking here, proof uh, by preponderance of the evidence, but there's no such thing as, quote, authoritative proof. Your Honor, I'm sure we're all gratified to know that the Post Office Department is doing so nicely, but it hardly has any bearing on this case. It has a great deal, Your Honor, if I may be allowed to proceed. By all means, Mr. Gailey. Your Honor, the figures I have just quoted indicate an efficiently run organization. Furthermore, the United States postal laws and regulations make it a criminal offense to willfully misdirect mail or intentionally deliver it to the wrong party. So there is something called the Supremacy Clause in the U.S. Constitution that requires that where the federal government has acted, that preempts state law contradictory action on that particular point. But on the other hand, it does create a precedence. Uh, state laws and courts rely on regulations uh, from the federal government, not for their preclusive effect, but often for their authority in very different cases. For example, if a state court is deciding a matter of first impression, it will often rely on federal court decisions or administrative decisions of the federal government in crafting its opinion, because while it's not bound by those decisions, it can use those opinions and decisions and regulations as persuasive authority. If the federal government has decided something, it lends a great deal of credence to the idea that that is what should actually happen in a matter of first impression before the state court. So what's happening here, relying on the post office, uh, presumably the administrative decision of the post office, has a ring of truth to it. State court judges do that all the time. I have further exhibits, Your Honor, but I hesitate to produce them. Oh, I'm sure we'll be very happy to see them. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, produce them, Mr. Gailey. Uh, put them here on my desk. But, Your Honor, Put I... them here on the desk. Put them... Yes, Your That's what we call the overwhelming weight of authority. Yes. All right, now it's time to give this holiday classic a grade for legal realism. It's been a long time since I've seen this movie, and I'm delighted to see all the legal accuracies. The hearing regarding mental commitment is both based in law and largely factually correct. The legal arguments are inventive, but somewhat realistic. However, on the other side, they gloss over the fact that Santa Claus committed assault, that he waived his Fifth Amendment rights, and kind of screwed up some of the constitutional arguments. But this is a clear holiday classic, so I'm going to give this wonderful holiday movie three candy canes. It's so wonderful, I don't see how I can give it anything less than that. And on the question of whether there really is a Santa Claus or not, well, as an officer of the court, I am bound by Supreme Court precedent and I can't lose my impartiality. But I will say this, if the real Santa Claus is out there and you're looking for the best attorney in the world, I will represent you pro bono. So happy holidays, Legal Eagles, and until next time, I'll see you in court.